He is the author of Remembrance of His Wonders, Nature and the Supernatural in Medieval Ashkenaz, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2017. And his current book project, O Beastly Jew, Jews, Animals, and Jewish Animals in the Middle Ages, explores the overlapping ways in which Jewish and Christian authors and artists distinguished humans from animals and Jews from Christians over the course of the Middle Ages. I'm now going to turn over the, uh, the microphone to Dr. Scheibitz. I'll ask to unmute and uh, spotlight his video. And without further ado, I welcome our very own Dr. David Scheibitz. Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Gelman. And if I could ask you if it's possible to allow for screen sharing, I have some sources that I'm gonna show, if that's all right. Okay, great. Almost there. Done, okay. Um, is the, are the slides uh, visible and everybody can hear me? Great, all right, thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure as always to, um, to have a chance to study uh, some Jewish history and some Torah together with, uh, with everybody in the shul. Um, and uh, you know, it's, I guess we're all used to the Zoom format by now uh, or as used to it as we can be but it definitely makes things feel less interactive on my end and I'm sure on your end also. So um, please don't hesitate to jump in, to unmute yourself uh, with questions, with comments, with uh, any you know, feedback or insights or thoughts about the sources that we're gonna be looking at. Um, and uh, I hope that we can you know, have some discussion and some, uh, some interactivity uh, rather than just you know, sort of a straight lecture. Um, okay, that said, I thought we could start with a probably pretty well-known text. Um, it's from uh, Pirkei Avot, from the third parak. And so I'm just gonna move my oops, screen around. There we go. Um, I'm gonna read uh, some of these sources in Hebrew, but we'll translate as we go. And I've given the English translation on the screen as well for anybody who, uh, who prefers that. So, Rabbi Shon Omer, Hamalech Baderech V'shoneh. Somebody is walking along the path and studying Torah reciting Torah, and if he stops, he pauses from reciting his, his teaching in order to observe, wow, what a beautiful tree, or what a beautiful field or clearing. In other words, somebody is walking down the path outdoors in nature uh, or in, uh, you know, in, uh, outside, and they interrupt their Torah study in order to um, admire God's creation. So the Torah teaches that this person, it's as though they have forfeited their soul. They are chayav mita, so to speak. Um, not literally, but figuratively. Uh, it's as though they deserve the death penalty. Now, this is a really strange and, uh, you know, maybe familiar, but nonetheless um, challenging text to grapple with. Um, Rabbi Gelman, I'm getting some uh, notifications about, I guess there's a waiting room maybe. Should I be admitting these people as they go? I assume so. Okay, well, I just admitted somebody. Um, uh, so, uh, a challenging um, uh, Mishnah, and one that's been the subject of a lot of different interpretations over the last, you know, 2,000 years or so, um, 1,800, 1,900 years or so. Why is it that somebody who interrupts their Torah study in order to observe, uh, make observations, to admire the natural world, why is that so serious? Why is that such a detrimental thing that it's as though they deserve the death penalty? Now, we could spend you know, a whole shiur or several shiurim uh, just tracing the interpretive history of this text. But I wanna jump ahead to one particularly provocative interpretation. And it's that of Micha Yosef Berdichevsky, who was a very well-known Haskalah scholar. The Haskalah is a, a period uh, in modern Jewish history, sometimes translated as the Jewish Enlightenment, where many often very learned traditional Jewish figures began to embrace secular culture, secular literature, philosophy, science, and uh, use that vantage point, use that lens to try to reinterpret or to make sense of the Jewish tradition. And Berdachevsky, in a collection of sort of observations, writings called Hir Hurim. So he says the following, Haipalea davar, is it any wonder that God's wonders 
Is it any wonder that people have arisen among us who have despised nature, and who considered the wonders of God to be completely extraneous? Is it any surprise, based on this mission, the one that we just saw, that we as a nation, the Jewish people, have become a non-nation, a non-people, non-humans? He says, I remember this teaching, uh, and Berdachevsky more than just remembered it, that he was a serious yeshiva bacher before he went, so to speak, off the derech and embraced other, other forms of, uh, of Judaism at the time. So he remembers this Mishnah, the one that we just saw. Having remembered this, one thought occurs to me as I am learning this Mishnah. Shirak az Yoshayu Davi Israel, salvation will come to the Jewish people. Kishem Mishnah Acheret Tinaten Lanu, only when there is a different teaching, a different tradition. Leimor Hamalech Baderach Vroe Ilan Nae, Nir Nae. That is to say that if somebody is walking down the path and observes nature, sees a beautiful tree, sees a beautiful field, Shemayim Naim, beautiful heavens. Uposek Mehem Ledivre Machshava Acheret, and if he interrupts the observation of the natural world for any other thought whatsoever, that's the person who ought to be Chayav Mita. And until that tradition replaces our previous tradition, until this new Mishnah replaces the old Mishnah, we will continue to be subhumans, a non-nation, non-people. Now, to understand where Berdachevsky is coming from, uh, it would take a lot of background to really fully plumb uh, his, his bi- biography and, and the historical context of the time. But suffice it to say that in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the idea that Jews are um, cut off from nature, the idea that Jews despise nature, the idea that Jews are urban, cosmopolitan, uh, sort of uh, you know, uh, immersed in finance and in trade and in commerce, and that they're unable to relate to or to appreciate or to fit into the natural world, that whole set of ideas was a very common trope of modern anti-Semitism. You can think about uh, sort of uh, you know, any of the well-known um, uh, anti-Semitic uh, figures and teachings and, and texts and, 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 and ideas of that time. And many of them play on this notion that the Jews are not a nation like other nations. They don't have a land that they belong to. They're not able to relate to the natural world, the beauty of the natural world. Instead, they are cosmopolitan. They go from place to place, from city to city undermining uh, other civilizations from the inside. And Berdachevsky seems to be internalizing that idea in a certain way. He's saying, we are actually to blame for this notion that we're cut off from the natural world. Because after all, look at our own traditions. Our own traditions say, ignore beautiful trees, ignore beautiful fields. Don't relate in any kind of positive way to our natural surroundings. Berdachevsky relates this Mishnah, conceptually, to another Mishnah, also from Pirkei Avot, this world is nothing other than a hallway or a, a passageway leading to the next world. And the whole point of this world is to do whatever you can as you're walking through the hallway before arriving at your final destination, which is the palace, the banquet room, the next world. And the idea here also at least in Berdachevsky's mind and in the minds of many modern Jewish um, uh, enlightened figures, the idea is that Judaism is not about or has not been about this world, about nature. It's been about sort of despising our physical bodies, despising the natural world, rushing through this uh, uh, level of, of, of existence as quickly as possible in order to arrive at the real goal, which is a disembodied supernatural olam haba. Now, I think there's a, a, a good argument to be made that Berdachevsky is really misreading both of these Mishnayot. Much of the traditional interpretation of that first mission that we saw um, in, uh, in Perak Gimel of, uh, of Pirkei Avot, um, mo- much of that interpretation focuses not on despising nature, but just on sort of a technical law of Bitul Torah. Um, so if you're interested in when you are and aren't allowed to not be learning Torah, this would be a primary source text that would be very important. Berdachevsky, again, is reading it very differently, but he's reflecting, as I've been trying to say, a sort of very common orientation in modern Jewish and non-Jewish thought, which is that, is it any wonder that Judaism and nature are fundamentally in tension 
with one another. They're fundamentally incompatible. And I'll give you just a couple of other examples of how this notion has really spread and become entrenched in the way that people think about Judaism. So here's an, uh, one of my favorite philosophical essays by a modern philosopher named Stephen Schwartzchild, who was actually a reform Jewish rabbi and a philosophy professor at Wash U in St. Louis, a very um, uh, sort of prominent late 20th century Jewish thinker. He writes an essay in 1984 called The Unnatural Jew. And he prefaces it with a great introduction. I, I could never get away with, you know, starting off an academic essay. Uh, I think it's hard to, to, to write, uh, you know, this way nowadays, but he starts off with a story, an anecdote. He says, in my philosophy department, the graduate students organize an annual picnic. And for some time past, the quasi formal invitations have explicitly excluded me on the grounds that I'm known to be at odds with nature. So there's a picnic happening. Let's make sure not to invite or to disinvite Professor Schwartzchild. Why? Because he's Jewish. And he says, I am at odds with nature. My dislike of nature goes deep. Non-human nature, mountain ranges, wilderness, tundra, even beautiful but unsettled landscapes strike me as opponents, which is the Bible commands, I am to fill and conquer. And I'm sure many of you are picking up on the, the translation here, the allusion, pru or vu umil u et shuha, right? God says to, to Adam and Chava in, in Gan Eden, um, fill the land, conquer it. And for Schwarzschild, this is a mitzvah that establishes a hierarchy with human beings dominating and exploiting nature, but not relating to it or appreciating it in any kind of fundamental way. Schwarzschild says, I really don't like the natural world, and I think it's foolish to tell me that I had better. This idea of Schwarzschild on a picnic, you know, out in a beautiful clearing, thinking about how much he hates the natural world or how much he ought to be filling it and conquering it reminds me of another great modern Jewish thinker. And I have to preface this by saying, um, this is another um, uh, Jewish thinker who is a very prominent and influential um, uh, sort of Jewish um, intellectual. Uh, by quoting him, I'm not endorsing him or any of the accusations that have been leveled against him in any way. But it's Woody Allen, who in 1975, in the movie Love and Death, there's a scene with him and Diane Keaton, and they're looking over um, sort of a beautiful vista sitting on top of a mountain, a, a gorgeous panorama. Um, and the Diane Keaton character says to Woody Allen, isn't nature incredible? And Woody Allen says, well, to me, nature is, I'm not gonna try my Woody Allen impression. Uh, I don't know, spiders and bugs and big fish eating little fish and plants eating plants and animals eating. It's like an enormous restaurant. Now, this is sort of the typical, uh, stereotypical Jewish orientation towards nature as we've seen in some of these sources, right? Where uh, the non-Jewish character looks out and sees nature as a gorgeous landscape, and Woody Allen sees it as nothing but sort of a restaurant that you'd find on, I don't know, the Upper West Side. Um, somebody's, uh, I think, microphone is, 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 um, is unmuted, and if it's possible to just mute that, please, again, as I said, don't hesitate to jump in and uh, uh, add questions or comments, but in the meantime, it just adds a little bit of feedback. Uh, some other examples, and we'll just run through this quickly, the idea that Jews don't camp. Uh, there's songs about this. There's all sorts of stand-up routines about this. Um, there's a line in a Daniel Silva book, the last time the Jews went camping, they spent 40 years wandering in the desert. This is all sort of like cringe-inducing humor, but I think it points to a certain kind of stereotype that's very, that's very widespread. And as we go along and sort of move from Jews don't camp to sl slightly more intellectual content, so Schwarzschild expands in his essay upon all the reasons why he hates the natural world. He says, might it be, and this is the position that he endorses, that Judaism and nature are fundamentally at odds because in Jewish thought, God and man are totally distinct from and superior to nature. Judaism and Jewish culture have paradigmatically and throughout history operated with a fundamental dichotomy between nature, what is, and ethics, what ought to be. Pagan ontologism, on the other hand, that's a sort of... Uh, Fancy way of saying, right, the pagan orientation towards the world, the pa pagan um, uh, conceptions about the nature of being. And the Christian synthesis of biblical transcendentalism and Greek incarnationalism, okay, we'll, we'll skip over some of the, the um, jargon here, results in human and historical submission to what are acclaimed as natural forces. In other words, if you are not embracing this Jewish idea that man is above the natural world, that man is distinct from the natural world, instead you might err in thinking that all of us are only controlled by natural forces, that there's nothing transcendent, there's nothing um, uh, divine uh, or sublime beyond 
the sort of simple material laws of nature. This idea that the Jews invented or developed this exploitative attitude towards the natural world has led to uh, some accusations that maybe Judaism and Christianity together with it are responsible for the current environmental crisis that we face. So way back in 1967, Lynn White Jr. wrote a really, um, uh, at the time, bombshell essay in the journal Science called The Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis. And he basically describes how Christianity inherited from Judaism a whole notion, a whole way of thinking about the world that leads only towards exploitation of the natural world, right? Where nature is not intrinsically meaningful, it's not connected to divinity, it's purely there for man to subdue and to dominate. And so if we wanna understand how to get out of our ecological crisis, Lynn White says, we need to figure out how to get out of Christianity and Judaism, or at least how to rethink them in fundamental ways that will do away with this exploitative attitude towards nature. Uh, I think we'll skip this for the time being and look at one last quote. Uh, and this is a poem by the great mid 20th century um, uh, uh, Jewish poet Paul Celan, who writes a German poem called Gespräch in Gebirg in 1959, a conversation in the mountains, which includes this immortal line. So it was quiet, quiet up in the mountains, but it was not quiet for long because the Jew comes along and meets another and silence cannot last even in the mountains because the Jew and nature are strangers to each other have always been and still are even today, even here. Now, again, this is a Jewish poet, but it almost reads like an anti-Semitic critique. We have this beautiful mountain vista and along comes some Jews, some talkative Jews, and all of a sudden the majesty, the silence, the transcendence of nature is, is disrupted, is shattered because Jews and nature are strangers to each other. Now, this has been a long introductory way of saying that there is an entrenched idea in modern Jewish culture that arguably dates back to some early Jewish sources that the natural world is not meaningful from a Jewish vantage point. And what I'd like to do with the rest of our time together is to show that this is one highly selective and maybe distorted view out of a multiplicity of different Jewish orientations towards the natural world, towards the world of Teva, that if we look in a broader historical perspective can hopefully enrich and expand and complicate some of the assumptions that we might have about Jewish theology vis-a-vis -vis nature and even about some of the challenges that we as a modern culture face uh, in terms of ecology and, uh, and our role vis-a-vis -vis the environment. And we'll begin that pivot, right, away from stereotypes and towards this more nuanced viewpoint by interrogating this poem in particular, right? Ceylon says it was quiet in the mountains but then Jews come along, these chatty, talkative, verbose Jews, and all of a sudden the silence is broken and nature is, is eviscerated. Well, that tends to assume, it sets up a dichotomy between nature and speech. Between on the one hand, the silent majesty of the natural world, and on the other hand, human culture, which is verbal, which is talkative, which is disruptive, right? Quiet and silence are characteristic of nature. Well, Ceylon knew some Jewish sources, but if he had gone back to some of the most fundamental Jewish sources, he might have realized that nature in the Jewish tradition is often not silent or quiet, but uh, sort of um, incredibly talkative. So for example, Hashamayim misaprim kvod kel ma'aseyadav ma'gida rakia. The heavens declare, right, misaprim, they speak of the glory of God, and his handiwork, Maaseh Adav, Magid Harakia, right, are, is proclaimed by the sky. Yom li yom yabia omer, v'layla layla yechaveh dat, ein omer ve'ein zvarim belin ishma kolam v'chol aret yisa kolam v'bukzet heva milim, right, we recite this uh, often. But what's assumed here is that if you look at the natural world in the right way, you find not silent majesty, but speech, right, that speech is, 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 uh, is an intrinsic part of thinking about nature. And that I think works not only on this sort of metaphorical level that we find here, right? The heavens declaring God's glory, but it even works on a lexical or a semantic level. Because I've been using a word for the last, I don't know, 10 minutes or so without being at all careful about defining it. And that word is nature. 
we might, if we want to get a clearer idea about how the Jewish tradition relates to the natural world, we might want to figure out what that word nature itself means. So we saw in Berdachevsky that the term he uses for nature is what is teva? And I'm sure that's the word that we all know, right? And it's the modern Hebrew word for nature as well. What a lot of people don't realize, however, is that we can trace, actually with a tremendous amount of specificity, when Jews invented nature, by which I mean when they developed a term, right, a noun, that means nature in Hebrew. Because if you look back to those earliest Jewish sources, if you look back to Tehillim or to the first chapter of Bereshit, there is no word for the natural world. And arguably, that might indicate that there's no conception the way that we have of what the natural world means. So let me unpack some of this a little bit. And in order to do so, we need to just take a brief step back into, uh, into the Middle Ages to the writings of the Rambam, right? Rambam, who uh, lives from 1135 to 1204 or 1205, born in Spain in Cordoba. Um, I'm sure many of us know some of the basics of his biography, ends up after many travails living in Fustat in Egypt, where he is the sort of consummate Jewish Renaissance man, uh, communal leader, communal rabbi, a legal scholar, author of the Mishnah Torah, the greatest halachic authority of his day, uh, author of many chuvot and responsa, also a philosopher, also a physician, right? Um, a kind of person who it's hard to imagine how he found the time to do everything that he, that he did. And in his philosophical writings in particular, Rambam tries to synthesize or to, um, to, to maybe come up with a compromise between Jewish tradition and between the philosophical uh, beliefs and scientific beliefs of his day, right? Sometimes this is sort of pithily summed up as reason and revelation. So Rambam is very well versed in the philosophy and science of the medieval Islamic world. Rambam reads voraciously in Arabic, um, uh, the writings of Aristotle, the, the um, Islamic theologians who are using Aristotle to think about their own Islamic tradition. And he applies much of that to the Jewish tradition as well. And in doing so, he writes, um, most importantly, a book called Moren Vuchim, or The Guide of the Perplexed, but he writes it in Arabic, and that's the title, Dalat al-Hayrin, in, in Arabic, the original title uh, of the work, in which he tries to reconcile science and philosophy and Judaism, basically doing a similar project for the Jewish tradition that many of his contemporaries were doing for the Islamic tradition. And eventually people will do this for the Christian tradition you know, a few decades later as well, trying to reconcile theology with, with nature and with science. Now, in the Moren Buchim, Rambam writes a lot about the natural world, but he does so again in Arabic. And to Arabic speaking Jews, that's all fine and good, but what about the Jews who want to read Rambam's insights, who want to figure out how to reconcile science with Judaism, but who don't know Arabic? So already during Rambam's lifetime, a movement develops to translate Rambam's uh, texts from Arabic into Hebrew. And that's done by a figure named Shmuel ibn Tibon, uh, who lives in Southern France. He's part of a family of translators, the Tibon family um, for several generations translates many of the greatest works of Jewish theology that I'm sure we all know about, Sadia Zemunot V'deot, Bachim, Pakudas, Chovot, Halavavot, lots and lots of others that are written in Arabic and translated into Hebrew. And as he does these translations, Shmuel Ibn Tibon realizes that he is stuck because Arabic has many words and concepts in the language that Hebrew simply doesn't have. And one example of that is nature. Rambam writes about Judaism and nature and Shmuel ibn Tibon tries to translate these writings into Hebrew, and he realizes, I don't have a word to use in Hebrew to mean nature in the way that Rambam is using it. And it's just one of many examples of terms that don't exist in Hebrew that he needs if he's going to do these translations of these philosophical and theological texts. And so what ibn Tibon does actually, even before he finishes the translations, is he writes himself a dictionary. It's called Perush Hamilot Hazarot, the, the uh, interpretation of foreign words where he does something that we probably know better from Ben Yehuda's time period, right? He makes up new Hebrew words so that he can then use them to write in Hebrew. And one of the words that he essentially invents to mean nature, the natural world, a sort of an encompassing uh, system is the word Teva. And so if you look back to Ibn Tibon's, uh, here's one, one page of it, the, the, the relevant page, you can still find this printed if you look at the Hebrew translations of, um, of uh, the Moren Buchim, um, they mostly include as an appendix, 
Shmuel ibn Tibon's Perosh and Milot Azorot. And here's a page from that, uh, from that uh, dictionary. And you can see down at the bottom, I'm not sure if my um, arrow is visible to all of you, but in case not, the bottom of the left-hand column under Ot Hatet. So here we have the word Teva where he basically describes, here are the Arabic terms that mean nature. And whenever I use the word teva in my translations, what I'm using them to, what I'm using it to mean is this Arabic concept, right? This concept drawn from Arabic sources of nature. So Ibn Tibon, in a way, invents nature for Jews. That doesn't mean that nature didn't exist, right? As, as sort of a material world, but the concept of nature the idea that there is something encompassing a system, a natural order, is a word that didn't exist until the 12th century, and arguably it may be an idea that didn't exist until the 12th century. Once we have terminology, it allows us to think in certain ways. Now, that being the case, it helps us to understand some of the ways that Rambam himself thinks about the relationship between Jews and the natural world. And I'll give you one example of how this works and the, the really important duty that Teva serves in, uh, in, in this uh, uh, sort of theological writing of the Rambam. The Mishnah in Masechet Chagiga, in the second parak, has a very cryptic um, and famously difficult to interpret um, uh, uh, ruling. The Mishnah says, Ein dorshin breshit bishnayim. You are not allowed to study or to teach or to expound upon the description of how Hashem created the world, with two people. What does that mean? Essentially, it means you can only teach it to one person at a time. You cannot have a group lesson in which you teach in which you unpack the hidden true meaning of what it means for Hashem to create the world. This is kind of a, um, a statement of esotericism. Certain kinds of teachings in, in Judaism are secret or need to be kept at least close to the best and only taught in a very limited capacity. So Rambam says one example of that is Maaseh Reshit, which can only be taught to one person at a time. And even more secret than that is Maaseh Merkava, the act of the divine chariot. This refers to the description of the Merkava in the first chapter, the first uh, Prakim of Sefer Yechezkel, right? Where Yechezkel, uh, we read this uh, as Aftorah, um, uh, right? Looks up into the sky, and sees different different uh, angels and different heavenly configurations. It's very sort of you know psychedelic seeming um, and very very um, uh, abstract and 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 mystical. And Rambam says that you can't even teach to a single person. You can only teach Maaseh Merkavat to one person, and that's if they only know if, if they already know it. Now, how do you teach something to somebody? Who already knows it? How did they learn it? This is sort of a, a famous paradox in, in this Mishnah, but essentially it means we have a ranked order of the most secret teachings of Judaism. I'm not going to reveal them to any of you. Well, most of them I'm not going to reveal now, um, but Maaseh Merkava is so secret that it can't be taught to anyone, and Maaseh Reshit is so secret that they can only be taught one person to another in a sort of highly constricted chain of tradition. That's an image, a Christian image of um, Maaseh Merkava for those um, who want to um, have a visual to accompany it. Now, Rambam does um, something a little bit subversive in his Perush HaMishnayot, in his commentary on this Mishnah, which is basically to reveal to everyone what Maaseh Merkava and Maaseh Breshit are, right? The Mishnah says, don't teach it. And he doesn't really get into the details here, but he does give a sort of general overview of here's what this refers to. And he says, by the Maaseh Breshit, the act of creation, what does it mean? It means the science of nature and the investigation into the creation of the world. And by the act of the divine chariot, Maaseh Merkava, it refers to the science of God, namely the explication of the rules of existence <clears throat> and the existence of the creator, <clears throat> excuse me, his knowledge, his form, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because of the importance of these two sciences, the natural and the divine, right? The natural sciences are Maaseh Breshit, and the divine sciences, metaphysics, is Maaseh Merkava. And on account of their significance, we are warned not to teach them in the same way as other sciences. This is what Rambam says. Now, again, Rambam is writing in what language? His Parish of Mishnayot is written in Arabic, not in Hebrew. And when the text is translated from Arabic into Hebrew by the Ibn Tibon family, they translate this term, the science of nature, as Chochmat Hateva, which means 
that when the Mishnah in Chagiga says that Maaseh Breshit is one of the most hidden, one of the most valuable, one of the most uh, sacrosanct elements of Jewish thought, what it means is science. And the word that is used from here on out to refer to that science is Chokmata Teva. In other words, Teva goes within a couple of decades from being a newly invented word to mean nature to eventually coming to be understood as the crux of Judaism, or at least one of the cruxes of Judaism, right? Because again, as Rambam is interpreting it, Ma'aseh Bereshit, which is this most hidden secret core element of the Jewish tradition, is Chokmat Teva. So what does this do for our dichotomy that we started off with, with Schwarzschild and the unnatural Jew in Berdachevsky? Well, in a certain sense, this undermines the idea that Jews have not been interested in nature, right? That people ma'asueta teva, the way that Berdachevsky says. Because look at Rambam, look at the core understanding of the crux of Judaism, and you'll find that chokmat teva is there. On the other hand, Schwarzschild was actually a scholar of Rambam. And I think he would have found this passage, passages like it, to reinforce his view. Because what Rambam is essentially doing is distinguishing very sharply between Maaseh Breshit on the one hand and Maaseh Merkava on the other, between the science of nature and the science of God. They're both important, but they're absolutely distinct from one another. So Teva helps us understand the creation of the world. Rambam, again, was a physician and a scientist. This is very important to him. But ultimately, theology boils down to metaphysics. It boils down to Maaseh Merkava, the science of God. And so when Schwarzschild says that Jews are distinct from nature, that there's this hierarchical arrangement where human beings and God are on top and the natural world is there to be exploited on the bottom, I think he could have found reinforcement in a passage like this one, which says that Maaseh Breshit and Maaseh Merkava are fundamentally distinct. Chokhmat Teva and Chokhmat Elohut, the science of God, never mix. And I think it's in response to that very sharp dichotomy that the readers of Rambam, begin to push back, and to push back very sharply. And an example is uh, not Rambam, but Ramban, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, who lives from 1194 to 1270, um, also born uh, in Spain, but he spends his life in Spain until the very end, uh, lives in Catalonia, um, in Girona, spends time in Barcelona and other parts of, uh, of Iberia. And he too is a really multifaceted um, a Jewish uh, rabbi and intellectual, right? A legal scholar. He writes um, um, uh, commentaries on, on, on the Talmud and lots of different sorts of engagement with halakha. He also writes his famous commentary on the Torah. He's also an anti-Christian polemicist. Many of you may know about the Barcelona disputation in 1263, where Ramban basically um, is forced to uh, debate the truth of Judaism vis-a-vis -vis Christianity with a representative of the Catholic Church and does so seemingly very effectively. And he's also a sort of a Kabbalist, uh, a Jewish mystic, somebody for whom Rambam's philosophical way of thinking about the Jewish tradition is at best incomplete and at worst totally wrong. And somebody who instead delves into the hidden mystical meaning of Judaism, not from a philosophical or scientific vantage point, but from a Kabbalistic vantage point. Um, and my screen is blocked here, so I actually can't see what it says at the bottom of my bottom slide. Uh, right, and that's a sort of a, a broader manifestation of a development in 13th century Spain where Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, is really becoming more and more prominent and more and more um, uh, well-known among Jewish thinkers. So Sefer HaZohar, for example, first um, we first find traces of it in writing um, as, a, as its sort of independent text. In, uh, in the 13th century in Spain, and Ramban is part of that broader story. So, given that Ramban's orientation towards Judaism, towards Jewish thought, is very different from Rambam's, Rambam's, what does he do with nature? Well, one of the places in which he gives us his most clear articulation of the meaning of the natural world is in a set of commentaries that he writes on Sifur Yitzhak Mitzrayim, on, uh, in, in Sefer Shemot. So the story of, uh, of uh, Moshe and Aaron turning their uh, staff into a serpent or the different interpretations of the, of the 10 plagues. Ramban in a few different places in his commentary on these stories describes how all of the different ways in which Hashem 
intervened in the natural world over the course of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, all the different, right, Ototum of team, all have a sort of a common um, goal behind them. So he says, This is why the Torah, whenever these signs and wonders and miracles take place, this is why the Torah says, That I am the Lord on earth. Leho wrote, Allah Hashkacha, it teaches us about divine providence. That Hashem directly intervenes in the world and is directly overseeing the fate of every individual at every event. Hashem doesn't abandon us to coincidence, to natural causality, right? to the rules of nature. Hashem is directly involved in every single thing that happens. And that's the lesson for Ramban of the Ten Plagues. And once people see these large, obvious miracles, this leads people also to uh, accept or to realize or to concede the existence of hidden miracles, which are at the core of the Torah. And here's his sort of programmatic statement. Nobody is a true believing Jew. You are not a true Jew in good standing unless you accept that every single thing that happens in the world is a miracle. There is no such thing as nature. Ramban says, Ein bahem teva, teva does not exist which is to say that when Hashem turns the Nile River into blood, that's a miracle. When Hashem kills every firstborn in the land of Egypt, that's a miracle. When the sun rises in the morning, that's a miracle. When you plant a seed and it grows into a flower, that's a miracle. And they're all of the same status. The only difference between them is that one is more obvious and one is less obvious. The Nile River turning into blood is a nes mifursam, and the sun rising in the morning is a nasty star, but fundamentally they're all the same. They're a direct intervention of God in the material world. There is no such thing as nature that operates independently from God. And here we're starting to see maybe some pushback to Rambam's idea that there's Chochmat Teva on the one hand and Chochmat Elohut on the other hand. Metaphysics and science are distinct from one another. Ramban would say it's all part and parcel of God's direct action on the world. Right? And that line, Ein Bahem Teva, Uminago Shalolam, is elsewhere in Ramban's writings. So, for example, in a lengthy um, drasha that survives that uh, Ramban wrote on Kohelet, he goes through a long description of different things in, in the world they think reflect natural causality the weather and human biology and agriculture. Right, all the different things that we take for granted as part of the laws of nature. Ramban says, kol ela nisim. Every single one of these is a miracle. When it rains, it's a miracle. When you have to clip your fingernails because they've grown, that's a miracle. Al ya'amin adam ima Torah bikyum hateva klal. The Torah categorically forbids one from believing in the existence of nature. And this idea on its surface seems to be also reinforcing Berdachevsky and uh, Schwarzschild and, uh, and Ceylon and some of those other guys, but from a different vantage point, right? Ramban said nature is important, but it's distinct from God. Oh, excuse me, Rambam said that nature is important, right? Chochomat Teva is important, but it's distinct from God. Ramban says, what is this Teva nonsense? Teva doesn't exist. You can't make up a new word, right? Steal it from Arabic and then decide that this is the core of the Jewish tradition. There's God and there's only God and everything else is extraneous. So from two different perspectives, we seem to be seeing a reinforcement of this idea that the Jewish tradition uh, vis-a-vis nature is very, very hostile. But that brings us to a slightly later contemporary of Ramban, another 13th century Spanish Jew named Joseph Gicatilla, Rav Joseph Gicatilla, um, a very important Kabbalist, and somebody who, along with other Kabbalists of his time, somebody like Rav Avram Abu Lafia, who's a very controversial Jewish Kabbalist, um, and others who are both um, 
uh, students of Rambam, they're very philosophically well-versed, but also students of Kabbalah. And these figures want to take the insights of Rambam and the insights of the Kabbalistic tradition and fuse them together. And one of the ways that they do so is with a fascinating gematria that you can see on the screen here in front of you. We first find in the writings of Abu Lafia and Joseph Jikatila the following equation. Hateva, the word nature, is equivalent in gematria to the word Elohim, God, which is itself equivalent in gematria to the word Hakisei, God's throne. All of them equal 86. Nature and God are not just complementary, they're identical, or at least they are equivalent in this sort of, uh, you know, um, a gematria equation. And nature can therefore be understood to be the throne of God, right? The natural world is something that God manifests himself through, something that God, so to speak, right, Kivayachol sits on. Now, this is an, I think, fascinating equivalence in and of itself, right? The idea that God equals nature in some way. But it's also amazing when we think about the fact that the word they're using for nature, again, is hateva. It's this word that did not mean nature until the mid-12th century. They've taken a word that Ibn Tibon essentially invented to mean the natural world based on his knowledge of Arabic. And now they've, it's become, for, for Jikatila and for Abu Lafia, it's become so fundamental to Judaism that you can use it for calculations in Gematria and you can even equate it with Elohim himself. Right? You see this really uh, sort of amazing lexicographical, if that's a word, right, or semantic incursion of an Arabic concept into a Hebrew word into the core of Kabbalah within a very short period of time, right? This is all happening in less than a century. And this idea that Hateva equals Elohim in some way is used by some of these Kab uh, uh, Kabbalistic scholars to reread many important um, sukim and ideas in Jewish tradition. So if we go back to Maaseb Reishit, for example, right, the creation of the world. So we all know uh, uh, the pasuk from, uh, from the beginning of the second parak of, of, of Reishit, that on Shabbat, Hashem rested from all of the work that he had done to create the world. If you plug in the fact that Elohim equals Hateva, says Jikatila, you get the following. Kivo Shabbat Mikol Melachto, on Shabbat, Hashem rested from all of his efforts. Asher bara Elohim, of having been creating Elohim, right? He spent his time in those first six days of creation, creating the natural world, right? Creating Hateva. It's a sort of a really subversive and interesting and counterintuitive reading of this pasuk. Kivo Shabbat Mikol Melachto, Asher bara Elohim. So that, not that Hashem created, but that nature was created by Hashem. Now, we're uh, coming up on, uh, I think, the end of our time. I actually wasn't given a firm end time by Rabbi Goldman, but I assume that we're just about at it. So let me start to wrap up. Um, okay. The idea that Elohim and Hateva are in some ways fused together or even identical to one another, it, uh, uh, I would say, helps us understand a lot of developments beginning in the Middle Ages and then really up until today that take that identity for granted. So for example, the Zohar has a well-known line that's quoted in, especially in, in Hasidic, uh, later Hasidic writings, late uh, atar panui mine. This is right in Aramaic. There is no space empty of him, of Hashem, which on a sort of moralistic or, um, uh, homiletical level means, right, Hashem is everywhere within us. There's nothing that cannot be divinized. There's nothing that doesn't have religious value if you treat it the right way. And that's all true. But on a ontological level, on the level of, of, um, of this sort of uh, equivalence we've been looking at, it's also a literally true statement. Everything in nature is God. There is no space in the natural world that does not have divinity within it. Or as, um, as we might say today, Hashem is here, Hashem is there. Hashem is truly everywhere, which might not seem like a very radical theological statement, but if Rambam heard that song, Rambam would throw a fit, I think, right? Um, the idea that Hashem is, is literally in everything in nature. So this is a term that sometimes is called panentheism, 
right? That Hashem and the natural world are, that everything in nature is within God, right? That God is, encompasses all of nature and is infused, is imminent within all of it. And that's what we find in the Zohar. It's what we find in, in Uncle Moishi. Um, it's what we find in, for example, Shir HaYichud, which we recite, uh, these days we mostly recite on, on Yom Kippur in, in, in the Ashkenazic tradition, um, but this is a very important um, tefillah from the Middle Ages. Asher mi'olam olam, heim kulam b'cha ve'ata b'kulam. Everything in the world is within you, God, and you are within all of it. So vevet ha'kol u'malei ha'kol, u'biyot ha'kol atab ha'kol. You surround everything and you fill everything and since you are everything, you're within everything. That, that is a sort of a radical panentheistic statement that goes along the lines of what we're seeing in Abu Lafia and Jikatila, that Hashem and the natural world are coterminous in a certain way. However, as I'm sure we can all imagine, this panentheism, again, the idea that everything within nature is infused with divinity, can easily translate, all too easily translate, into pantheism, where instead of showing that nature is divinized, we instead try to naturalize, right, the divine. And that's a direction most associated with another great Jewish thinker, but, you know, not somebody who, uh, who uh, is, um, is sort of, uh, you know, accepted in, 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 in traditional Jewish circles for good reason, uh, Spinoza, whose core contribution to this debate is in the Latin line from uh, his work, The Ethics, Deus Sive Natura, right? Spinoza, who lives in Amsterdam, he's uh, raised uh, and educated as a Jew, becomes a radical philosopher and is eventually expelled from the Jewish community. And it's in large part for lines like this one, God, Deus, that is to say nature, right? Where he says, not that the natural world is full of divinity, but that God is essentially only, is confined to natural causation. And there's nothing divine outside of the natural world. And that very radical teaching um, is more along the lines of pantheism, that nature and God are the same rather than nature being encompassed within God and, and full of divinity. And we find other, uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip over some of this now, we find other articulations of this view in other modern Jewish thinkers. Now, the challenge for us, I think, is figuring out a way to relate these theological ideas to some of the assumptions that we all hold that we saw at the beginning of, the, of our talk and the challenges that we face as Jews and as human beings in the 21st century. I think it's very clear to me that Schwarzschild and uh, Berdachevsky and Paul Celan wouldn't have recognized the panentheism of Abu Lafia and Jikatila and Shir HaYichud and, uh, and the Zohar, right? All of which say that Jews and nature are not foreign to one another, but that the natural world is a site of divinity and that a proper appreciation of God leads to an appreciation of nature and a proper appreciation of nature in turn leads to a reliance or an acceptance, right? Or an embrace of, of the God who created it and who is infused within it, right? That theological idea to me is very appealing. Obviously to Schwarzschild and to some of those Jewish thinkers at the beginning is very foreign. The question for us today is given where we as Jews and where we as Americans and we as human beings find ourselves and the challenges that we face vis-a-vis -vis the future of the natural world, how are we going to, or are we going to take the lessons of the Jewish tradition and apply them? What does this insight that Hashem is infused in the natural world, what does it do for the way that we relate to the natural world, for the way we make decisions and choices as they affect the natural world? I don't have any answers to this. And obviously, you know, if I did, I wouldn't be preaching them. Uh, that's not my role. But I do think it's important to see that some of the challenges that we face and some of the ways that we can be thinking about our relationship to, to Teva and then therefore to Elohim, right? They're not being born in a vacuum. They draw on this long 2000 plus year tradition of Jews grappling with and thinking about and debating what is our relationship to nature and what is our responsibility for nature and what is Hashem's relationship to the natural world. And I hope that uh, some of those simplistic uh, stereotypes that we started off with now seem a lot less tenable. And we're able to see in a broader perspective, some of the different, uh, different viewpoints that are within our tradition there to be drawn upon. Uh, sorry for uh, my long windedness, uh, but thank you all so much for your attention. And um, if we have time, I'm happy to discuss or um, answer questions. Dr. Shaivitz, thank you I very much. If I can ask a question um, and, uh, as well. Um, you know, in the last, especially in the last component of the Klav, the Shir, 
I was thinking about how this might be uh, applied in our current uh, situation. If you look at the, the political divide as they uh, address nature, it, it seems that it's uh, one group who touts nature and science as sort of reigning supreme. The other one uh, refers to God and that sometimes these two components uh, are not uh, viewed as, as being uh, interactive. And that, uh, that if one was to adapt, adopt a panentheist approach as opposed to a pantheist approach, you'd have no problem squaring that, uh, uh, that circle. You'd have no problem saying that we could marvel in science and nature, but understand that ultimately behind it or through it is the, uh, the function of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Um, is, yeah. that, is that a fair conclusion? I, it's a fair conclusion that definitely resonates for me very much. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we see in some of those early sources is, you know, sort of, um, it's, it's easy to move from the idea that, um, it's easy to move from the idea that nature is within God and to move towards the notion that, um, or, or I should say, that is hard to reconcile with another very you know, sort of intrinsic component of the Jewish tradition, which is that there is a hierarchical relationship, right? That Hashem is sort of at the top of the chain of being, so to speak, and that human beings are distinct from and superior to animals and, and to plants, right? And there is a sort of like hierarchy that we can see in, in, in Maaseh Breshit and in lots of Jewish sources. And how to, I think, square that hierarchical view with this panentheistic view, that's itself very challenging, right? Because panentheism would say everything is, is divine, and the hierarchy would say, well, fine, maybe everything's divine, but there's still are gradations and we still should be able to use nature and exploit nature and right, ideas about vegetarianism and about um, you know, different ways of exploiting the, the natural world, they all come into play here, right? Do we treat everything as undifferentiated divinity, right? That's infused into the natural world or do we think about our place as, you know, mil ueta aretz ve kivshua, as Schwarzschild said, right? That our goal is actually to conquer the natural world. So that's a hard square to circle the square or whatever the, the expression is, right? That's a hard tension to grapple with. Um, and I guess my hope is just that if we have more insight into some of these very interesting and complicated and nuanced sources, it gives us the tools to think about in terms of how we reconcile these different competing values. I have a question. Please. Um... When you say in Bara, uh, Bara Shit, it say, Kibo Shabbat Mikol Malach to Asher Bara Elohim, you imply like Teva in Elohim, because Gematria gives the 86, did you say the number? Yeah. And also, can we uh, say Bara Hakisei? Yeah, um, so I mean, that would work. That would work. We could. It's, what, what, it's what amazing. The... When you say the gematria, because I'm studying this Shabbat I was studying, and when I when you say it, it's amazing the message that if we so Baraja say. So one of the other, um, I, I I mean, one of the great things about uh, about these sources is yeah, once once you once you figure out the gematria equivalencies, right? And gematria may or may not resonate for any of us, right? You may or may not find this to be convincing, but for certainly the people who are articulating these ideas in the Middle Ages, they found it very convincing. <clears throat> and it allows you exactly as you're saying, to you know, sub in one word for another. And sometimes that can lead to very, very insightful readings. I'll give you another example. Um, in, in, in Jigatila also uses this equivalency to read, um, if we go back to uh, that slide from before with the 10 plagues and the, the serpent, right? Um, the staff turning into a serpent. So the, the Khartoumim in Egypt, they say, Espa Elohim hi. Um, and what Jikatila reads is that what they meant by that is this is all nature, right? This is Hateva. Whereas what Moshe and Aaron are doing is, is showing that it's actually divine, right? It's actually, so again, the sort of blurriness of the line between what is natural causation and what is divine intervention, the more we blur that line, the more that these texts can be sort of multivalent, right? And we can understand, oh, well, what were the Khatumim saying and what did Moshe and Aaron intend? Um, at least these really, really interesting I think, um, interpretive sort of moves. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no more questions, uh, I just want to uh, thank Dr. Scheibitz again. Always, uh, we learn a tremendous amount every time he shares uh, history Torah with us from his vast uh, experience and research. And we are grateful to have you in the Shulam community and uh, personally as a friend. 
I would like to just one more time push uh, next week is the last part of this cycle in the series. We will be welcoming our very own Rabbi Dr. Zev Elif. The topic for next week's lecture um, will be authentically orthodox, a new way to understand change in American Orthodox life. We go from the Middle Ages to contemporary Jewish history, which is always exciting because we get to talk about figures and familiar events that, that we know in our own lives. Uh, that'll be next week. Starting towards the end of January, we begin our next cycle of Sunday morning Zoom lectures. We have, I think, another 10 to 15 uh, guest speakers from local as well as around the world lined up already. If you would like to be a part of this, if you'd like to help sponsor and make this programming possible, please contact me. Do not hesitate. And again, thank you, Dr. Scheibitz. I have one more question. Oh, I think it's my father. Uh, I'm so sorry. How are you? Uh, if you don't mind, uh, I keep thinking about Noah, the ultimate um, uh, naturalist, the ultimate, uh, 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 if you will, uh, metaphor for uh, uh, environmentalist. Uh, how do you uh, synthesize or how do you fit this into this entire um, um, concept of uh, pantheism and uh, the Jewish view of, uh, of uh, you know, it's very tempting to talk about Noah in this context. What are your thoughts about this? Um, yeah, what an interesting question. So, um, so I, I have, the truth is I have a lot of thoughts, but I'm going to, I'm going to confine myself. Um, let, let me, um, I'll start counterintuitively. Um, I have a colleague at Northwestern um, in the history department, uh, a really wonderful person whose name is uh, Lydia Barnett, uh, Dr. Professor Lydia Barnett, um, who is not a scholar of Jewish history. She's a scholar of, uh, of European, uh, early modern European history. Um, she wrote a book about Christian interpretations uh, during the Renaissance and, and later of the story of Noah, right, of, of the flood story. And basically what she shows is that they, those Christian thinkers use the flood story as a way of thinking about what today we would call global warming or climate change. Um, because you find in a lot of those sources, uh, the idea that when the flood came and sort of destroyed the world and then, you know, Noah, you know, recreated it from, from scratch or, you know, had to repopulate it, that the way nature worked before the flood was different from the way nature worked after the flood. And essentially that uh, it, it shows us that nature was not always understood as a sort of constant steady system, but as something that was mutable, something that could change, right? Something that uh, the laws of nature transformed as time went on. Um, and after I read her book, I said to her, you know, it's fascinating because there's much earlier Jewish sources that point to the same idea, right? The idea that after the flood, nature operated differently than it did before the flood. People's time sp uh, lifespans were different before and after. Um, even in, uh, in medieval Ashkenaz, which is the, the period that I study that I'm most, um, most familiar with, we have in the, the Balea vote the idea of that nature sometimes, the rules of nature change. And you know, people used to believe that nature worked in a certain way, and these days you know, it works differently. Um, so I do think actually there's a lot of material that we could look at in the Jewish tradition, but then also in other traditions, that think about the flood as like a thought experiment for how to relate to the fact that the laws of nature seem to change as time goes on. Um, and I, you know, something I'm interested in and I'm working on a little bit is actually how to, how to use that to make sense of debates about climate change today, right? That maybe we can think about an, a Jewish orientation towards climate change based on some of these Jewish sources that actually took for granted that right? That, that, that climate, that nature does actually change over time and what the meaning of that is vis-a-vis, -vis, um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis God. Um, so it's not a, like an answer, but maybe it's like a direction for how one could think about this kind of an issue. Um, uh, but I think it's a, you know, a really valuable question. Thank you. By the way, uh, 